All right, so uh, this afternoon we're going to go after, or go over Chapter 11. It's electrical and uh, HVAC hazards. Um, this is an important chapter, um, I feel, because a lot of, as an investigator, uh, we, we see a lot of issues with electrical hazards. Um, and that's a, a cause of a lot of the accidental fires that, that we deal with. So uh, for an inspector to be aware of these issues and uh, to be able to, to recognize them and, and uh, point them out, is, you know, it's a could be what keeps a building or a city block from burning down. So um, we'll, uh, we'll go over these chapters. Uh, some some of you may have some experience in electrical or or uh, HVAC. If you if you got anything that you spot that you want to share with everybody else, you know by all means, um, you know we'll we'll have the class involvement on that for sure. But um, we'll we'll make sure to uh, to cover everything. And if again if there's any questions, you know let me know. We'll we'll address those and and uh, make sure that everybody's uh, familiar and, and understand what the material is. Our objectives tonight is uh, we're going to talk about the components of an electrical system, uh, protective practices and equipment of an electrical system, and the common hazards. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about how to, to identify and seek correction of electrical hazards and the components and operations of a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. Uh, we'll talk about the, the potential hazards that comes from HVAC systems and the uh, the impact of heating, ventilation, and uh, all that on smoke movement throughout the building and uh, how to uh, seek corrective action on HVAC systems. All right, as an inspector, we need to be aware of these. Uh, like I said, you know, with uh, malfunctioning electrical, electrical systems cause fire. Um, and uh, you know, we may find damaged or defective uh, parts of an electrical system, um, and it could be misused, uh, wired improperly, um, a lot of different things. The electrical inspectors verify compliance for electrical code. Uh, I know in our area, the building officials, also the electrical inspector, and uh, and. You know, that's something that's really important to to make sure of the integrity of the electrical system in the new buildings. Um, ensure that electrical, electrical systems uh, don't provide ignition sources by checking the uh, enclosures, the wiring. We want to make sure the um, insulation on the wiring is, is intact, that the... Um, that the wiring is tightly secured. Uh, if you you see something that's uh, if it's loose, and, and a lot of times you can't go in there and just kind of wiggle around. Uh, so that's something if you visually look at it and it looks like it's not tightened down properly, uh, if it looks like it's bound up by something uh, anywhere that it uh, and it's something that's it's kind of hard to describe, but it's easy to see that uh, if you see something that's messed up on a an electrical system like a loose wiring or something like that it's uh, good to spot that and to, to point that out uh, loose connections can cause arcing and that arcing can cause heat uh, which will will then um, cause issues and cause fires and uh, we can point that out and um, and get that repaired uh, a lot of times if we're in a um, Kind of a final inspection, and, and they haven't energized the uh, the panel or the electrical wiring yet. We can uh, take closer looks at it. But uh, again, or uh, or to put out to everybody, make sure whenever you're looking at any of the electrical components, um, make sure that they're not energized. I don't know why they don't have a safety disclaimer first, but uh, let's make sure that we're not getting shocked by some of this high current. Um, electrical systems and, and all that uh, it, before touching or checking it. Uh, they have a little device. It's a, a little electrical uh, current detector. They're really inexpensive. They're probably about you know, 15 to $20. And um, 
you can activate it around any type of wiring or anything um anything that's carrying a current and it'll it'll beep if it's energized and uh, that's something if you do a lot of inspections and ex especially like construction um inspections or or if you will in the future it's just good practice go ahead and, and grab up one of those for your own uh personal use so uh, whenever you're looking in the panels and you're looking at wiring and stuff that uh you can ensure that it's not energized. <clears throat> we uh, we also check for the uh, equipment location and maintenance, uh, and that's where we look at the conditions of the the wiring or the electrical com components, the location of it. Being also, is it an area that it's a utility room that's accessible from the outside of a building? Um, is there water leaking in? Is there standing water in the utility room that May cause a hazard, an electrocutional hazard, you know, not only just a fire hazard. Um, another thing is is checking the grounds, make sure that the grounding um, systems are are in place and properly connected. Uh, in older construction, you're not going to find a lot of uh, use of, of grounding, but now it's everything is kind of built around making sure that the system in and of itself is is properly grounded. Uh, so that's a very important uh, part of new construction. All right, we have to be aware of these uh, the hazards of uh, HVAC uh, systems as well. Their damage if they inoperate, uh, inoperate, uh, inoperative or misused, uh, they can malfunction, can spread smoke during a fire, then cause um, be the cause of smoke in a building. Um, how many times do we get called out to smoke in a building and it's um, a HVAC blower motor or, or fan motor? that has bit the dirt and it's smoking out. Um, I've also seen a couple times where that was the cause of fires. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of hazards that can come from, from these systems. All right, an overview of the, the basic electrical system is uh, that it delivers the electrical power to the appliance or, or electronic device. As you can see in the, the pictures to the right, utility pole with your service line it comes in through the weather head down into the meter pan uh, through the meter pan it goes into the the circuit breaker box um, on the the inside and from the circuit breakers it's wired in to your wall outlets to where the end user connects in all kinds of devices um, the only thing is on this picture it doesn't really show the connections um, and how it's all wired in, but um, that's something. There, there's several different um, training videos and how-to videos on YouTube. If you're not familiar with the, with electricals, you know, take a little bit of time to research it on your own so that you can kind of build up a knowledge on how receptacles and switches and GFI and um, EFI and um, all these different outlet. Um, systems work how they're wired in so that whenever you you look at them um, you can you can look to make sure that they're installed properly and uh, it kind of gives you a, a leg up on that all right some uh, basic concepts of, uh, of electricity that that uh, is good to help to uh, you be aware of is the rating of extension cords um, I hate extension cords. As a fire inspector, um, I've been in many a buildings where they'll try to hook up something that's pulling a lot of amperage through a little cord. Um, misuse of a dollar store extension cord almost killed a family of six last week. Um, I hate them uh, because they're they're so. Uh, so widely misused and we do see these a lot in commercial uh, buildings and commercial properties people don't want to to properly run the con the conduit and, and go through breakers and things like that um, if you look in the code ex uh, um, extension cords are only used for mobile appliances and it has to be rated for that appliance you you can't go and um, connect in a dollar store extension cord with a very small gauge wiring 
um, to, and expect to power something that's going to draw a lot of amperage for an extended period of time. And you know, you're definitely going to have it overheating um, and uh, can start a fire. We want to look at the requirements for electrical appliances, and that's where we're going to make sure that our systems are not overloaded. Your typical residential, and, and for the most part, your commercial is, is going to be a 200 amp system. Um, and uh, you, know, you want to make sure that they're not running electrical appliances that call for uh, more, more amperage, more flow, or uh, more voltage than what the system is designed to handle. Now, typically, in, in a lot of those systems, they, they're not going to function properly, but there's, there's ways around everything, and this is what we're talking about, the misuse of uh, in, in improperly uh, wired and connected appliances. Um, and you'll see these, these improper wiring techniques and in, in, uh, especially kind of some older buildings where they've renovated and you know it's when uh they're typically trying to do it under budget they're trying to uh to squeeze by with making it cheaper and easier and that yeah, may not always be the right thing to do all right a little bit of terminology is volts now volts is going to be the force required to move at the or to conduct the electricity the current is going to be the amount of electricity flowing. The power comes from your amps. That's going to be the volume of electrical flow. And watts is going to be the total electrical power available for use. All right. If you remove the volts, current, power, amperage, watt, that's a lot of it that you can relate to. As firefighters, you can relate to hoses and your hydrology and uh, being able to, um, you know, supply water to a fire scene is the same kind of thought process um, of the electrical system. How much pressure, um, you know, how many gallons, the uh, and your your gallonage that you're able to move by your size of hose, and then you know, what you're expected to get out of it, and your total amount of gallonage um, for the type of fire. Um, and then resistance, you know, where we, we see this a lot in, and also the, uh, um, whenever we're using appliances and we, we have that friction loss, um, the same thing as the resistance that, uh, and that's going to be measured in, in, uh, ohms. Uh, that's if you put meters on, on things, which, you know, you may or may not have to, to have some items metered as a, as an inspector, but being familiar with the that measurement is a uh, is pretty important all right potential ele electrical hazards arcing and overheating are main cause of electrical fire uh, you can see uh, as an in investigator you can look and see on the wirings and you can look for signs of arcing and uh and also signs of overheating on the wiring that it can kind of tell you what the the cause um, you see a lot of the arcing, um, a lot in especially older construction where they're using older type um, electrical systems that are just wore out. And uh, you know the main thing is the the insulators um, that protect against that arcing. But uh, arcing can produce enough heat to ignite combustibles very easily. Um, you know this is talking about the uh, the discharge across the gap. Gaps can form as items um, get loosened you know say for instance and this is just say that you have um, a washer machine that's unbalanced and whenever it goes through its spin cycle it shakes and shakes and shakes and it vibrates part of the house all right over several years you may see or you may not see it but you may have a a wire tied in uh, to a receptacle that over that that many years of vibrating that it's loosened up to the point where it's formed a gap and that that electricity is discharging across that gap arcing and uh, 
overheating causing that firing and uh and causing the uh or causing heat and allowing the nearby combustibles to ignite so um yeah that's something that we really want to uh to try to be aware of as we're conducting in inspections and that if we again if we can visually see something that just kind of looks a little off we will look close um just to make sure that everything's properly wired together and um you know overheating may also uh, occur from conductors and other equipment um and it could be for a lot of different reasons maybe the the uh equipment's pulling too much energy too much power all right to uh, prevent this we're going to uh we have a overcurrent protection um and a open circuit if the amount of current will cause an excessive or, or dangerous temperature all right as we look at the circuit breakers a closed circuit means that everything's flowing the electrons the electricity is flowing throughout the system properly if it's open then there's a gap in it and is not flowing so um it basically the uh, the power is cut off if the circuit is open uh, if the uh, cir circuit's closed then um, the electricity is free to move or, along the system um, now you see these uh the two forms in these pictures to the right one of them is going to be a circuit breaker um, and it can can detect the um, excessive uh, current or temperature and it will will uh, by the use of expanded metal on the inside can cause the breaker to switch to flip and that'll open up the circuit and uh, will stop the flow of electricity over on the right side you see a, a panel box that uses fuses and they use a a uh, type of material that under a certain temperature or a certain voltage load or amperage load that it will melt and it will open up the circuit at that point causing um, the electricity to uh, to stop so these are kind of our, our two functions that we have in place to protect from overcurrent and um, talked about the fuses there's the plug fuses cartridge fuses and renewable link cartridge fuses um, and you may see a variety of, of these different devices used um, especially if it's kind of an older construction that's being renovated and updated or uh, expanded on you may have a, an expansion to that building um, where they've added on other rooms or sections or whatever and you can kind of see an interface between old and new sometimes all right uh some circuit breakers we talked about that now you have the ground fault um circuit interrupter and those you're going to typically see around uh if it's around water or um certain type of operations you have equipment ground fault protective device and then uh arc fault circuit inter interrupter I think I said E F I C earlier. I, uh, it should be A F I C I, the uh, arc fault circuit interrupter. Um, but according to the type of construction, uh, the type of occupancy, the uh, or the uh, process methods that are, are for a building, your building official may require different type of of uh, breakers or um like a gfi outlet and um you, know, you may as well if you you see that the code warrants it and, and you see a need for it all right uh, grounding it up uh, provides a path for straight current and static electricity to flow um and it's typically you'll see uh coming out of the um circuit breaker box and then also out of your um i'm sorry not out of the circuit breaker this is an example of it but you may see it in your uh, on the outside near your um, um power meter box uh, you may see a copper or aluminum wire that comes out of there and it goes down into a about an eight foot copper rod that's hammered into the ground and uh it is uh, connected in 
and that allows for that that excess current or that static electricity to be be dispersed into the ground and uh, it protects your electrical equipment and the system um, in the event that there's an overcurrent and things like that as well um, that that can flow off of it and over in this picture you see where they're using um, some underground water pipe is, is grounding um, I think that's maybe kind of a thing you see mostly up north uh, most places around here most uh, authorities that I'm familiar with require the ground rod and they uh, they want it into the main uh, wired into the the main uh, meter pan <clears throat> all right uh, talking about grounding uh, this is something as you're uh, inspecting especially uh, new construction and they're putting in a sprinkler system uh, it, you have to check to make sure that it's uh, grounded as well that it's bonded into the grounding system and um, then you have certain metal components and cord and plug appliances uh, should be grounded and they may have a, a separate ground uh, specifically for them according to the size and of uh, electricity it's going to use all right generators we we kind of see that it's it's more and more common um, that we see these not only in industrial settings but in residential settings or i know in our area uh, we see a lot of uh, of generators in use um, the uh, as listed as the installation issues is protection of fuel source um, and then the shock hazard and then um, you know we have to inspect the fuel source to uh, to check it. Most of the time, it's either a diesel fuel or some type of LP gas that fuels the generators. Um, just you may have to ask questions and and, uh, and research what type it is, and um, you know, make sure that that everything's being properly maintained. Um, you may have an area that has a generator room. And there may be certain specs on code for for that generator room and how it's wired and different features and functions all right your tra transfer switch uh, has to be used between a generator and the building's electrical yeah, electrical system what a transfer switch is going to do is that in the event that there's a power loss from the main um, power service it will shut off the connection to the the main service to the building what you would normally use every day that comes from the power lines and it will connect in to the generator and it will allow that the building to be fed off of the generator's power and not the power company's power and it, it opens that circuit to the the power pole or the um, electrical wiring coming in from the poles so that you're not back feeding electricity uh, say that there's during a hurricane storm uh, somebody uh, somebody's car takes out a light pole down the road um, and you may have power lines down and all that and this prevents those lines that may be cut off by the transformer or something from being re-energized by your your generator uh, so we, we make sure that the transfer switch is in place and uh, that's installed properly. There's automatics uh, and there's manual transfer switches that are out there. Um, and um, you know, most of the time, that's going to be on the building uh, inspector side of it to uh, check all that. But it doesn't hurt to go back and and uh, look at it as well as a fire inspector. All right, transformers. Um, you may find transformers like what's shown here in large industrial facilities, and typically they're going to be fenced off. Um, you may also have these large uh, transfer, uh, transformer or, or utility yards in your jur jurisdiction where um, there's a lot of electricity flowing around there. And uh, that's one of those things we, if even if there is a fire incident in those locations, we want to make sure that we wait for a representative from the power company. Uh, we don't want to go in there blindly because um, the amount of, of power that's um, operating in, in those systems are extremely high and 
uh, can jump over a distance and, and all that. Um, little safety, a little safety spill there. All right, the types of the transformers, there's dry type that use air uh, as a te temperature maintenance mechanism. Uh, we have fluid filled transformers that typically use a, a form of oil to remain cool. Uh, that's typically what you're going to find on your like your residential power service is the liquid i mean the fluid field transformers um back in the day and there may be some still out according to your your jurisdiction but they had some transformers and the um the oil was very toxic in them uh, nowadays they they use a, a form of mineral spirits that um or mineral oil rather that um is not as harmful. <clears throat> and uh, that's what I was talking about, the polychlora, uh, bifenol, and uh, the, or PVCs fluid, it's being phased out. And, um, you know, the uh, mineral oil is uh, being used now. All right, your high temperatures are uh, require adequate ventilation and outdoor transformers sh should leak fluids away uh, from buildings. Uh, they kind of, most of them should have like a containment berm or a containment area that uh, prevents these oils from um, getting released out and causing issues. All right, some things to look for during the fire inspection. So, some things that, that uh, we're going to take a look at. Now, hopefully, our electrical inspector has a sharp eye and it's probably a good idea if you can to schedule some type of uh, new construction inspection with your electrical inspector so that both of y'all can put eyes on it um, especially if you're not as familiar with electrical systems now um, the common problems that we're going to see is issues from improper installation uh, damage to the existing wiring and uh, you know that could cause the the wiring to short arc or become overloaded and to you know as it as it arcs shorts out uh, or becomes overloaded it can start a fire and that's what we're here to, to uh, prevent so uh, we want to keep out uh, an eye out for the uh, damaged wiring and uh, improper installation <clears throat> All right, electrical equipment. So we may see it used improperly or it's not properly maintained. Um, now, not only is this an ignition source or a probable possible ignition source, uh, it also could be a shock hazard. So we want to make sure that uh, either the electrical equipment that is used in different processes uh, are used properly and, and properly maintained. All right. Cables, conduits, and raceways. Uh, the conduit's going to be around pipe. They hold a bunch of wires in it, um, and they can go from tiny little half inch all the way up to 10 inch, 12 inch, according to the amount of wire, size of wire. Um, and that's typically your, your bigger stuff's going to be to the extreme, and that's going to be in your industrial, large industrial settings. Um, now, raceways are going to be the narrow channels that holds wires and are threaded through walls and ceilings. Um, conduits and, and uh, raceways should be secured properly uh, for a couple reasons. One being that you look at it, that if it's properly in place, it's less likely that something's going to accidentally snag it and uh, pull on the wires and cause a um, either the, the insulation to get torn somewhere in the conduit if it's a metal conduit or uh, to be pulled from a connection or making a connection loose to start a fire for a bunch of different reasons we want to make sure that it's secured properly uh, but also if you look at it if the building does catch on fire um, that conduit and the raceways and things like that is what's helping that wire stay up and out of the way so it doesn't make a spider web mess for our firefighters going in and uh, our suppression teams to go in and, and uh, fight fires. And so um, a lot of good reasons we want the uh, conduits and raceways to be secured. 
<clears throat> all right, we want to protect uh, cables and and, uh, and and all of our electrical compo components from any type of mechanical damage, anything rubbing up against it, hitting on anything like that, and overload. You see here in this picture where it appears that the um, system's been damaged. Um, you can kind of see the browning from the heat. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's not a good system there. That's uh, a fire waiting to happen. So we want to be aware of of these signs and these tails um, that this picture really shows of the the if there's a problem if you see an outlet that has a little browning around it um and even though i mean guys i, I know several of y'all have been in the fire service for quite a while you, know, you can kind of smell you can smell heat you can kind of smell um maybe something getting hot um kind of like that uh, ballast smell or something um so you kind of use your senses as well as your eyes whenever you're you're doing these inspections and the dang extension cords um they should not replace fixed wiring now, i know there's probably several places that you can think of right now where you see this very same thing um it's not um it shouldn't supply equipment beyond its capacity even when used properly and uh, it should be well maintained and properly located um, and that's something if you see an extension cord being properly used for a piece of mobile equipment, then you, know, you can take a look at it. Make sure there's no cracking in the, uh, the insulation. There's no bare wiring shown that it's, um, it's properly, uh, secured. You may have a, um, an extension cord that's been wired together. And if it's, is properly put together, you know, should do fine, but you check the components of it to make sure that it's, uh, it, it's going to do the job that it is there to do. Um, and, and also you kind of your standard fire prevention week that we teach everybody, you know, making sure that there's nothing piled on top of it. Um, you may have something, <clears throat> excuse me, laid over, an extension cord piled on top of an extension cord. Uh, it may be a path where machines or um, uh, little truck trolleys or whatever that moving material runs over several times throughout the day. And uh, and that's something that should be addressed because with all that, that mechanical damage and, and friction on it can wear on them and cause some issues. All right, checking the uh, outlets and, and uh, switches. Uh, now the outlets is, is your regular receptacles and uh, you know, that's where the current's taken and supplies the equipment that you're plugging into it. Now the switch is a set of contacts that interrupts or controls the uh, current flow. And uh, we wanna look for cracked or broken switches and outlets uh, or evidence of overheating. That's what I talked about, that little browning uh, around the components and you could sometimes see it if it's some ex uh, excess heat and you may even see some where it's just a little bit melted um, be aware of that and to uh, to look out for that that's something that can be an issue to be wrote up to be repaired and um, you know there's a reason why it's overheating that needs to be inspected as well or uh, by a, a, an electrician All right, your electrical system boxes. So this example of a breaker box <clears throat> it houses and, and uh, protects the equipment and connections. Uh, it needs to be equipped with the proper covers. All right, that way that you don't accidentally reach in there and touch bare wiring and, and uh, get shocked. Or uh, you may have critters that get in there. Uh, I've seen it <laughs> where uh, mice, for whatever reason, want to get in there. Um, you may have some other insects or animals that get in there and can, uh, can cause an arc against or across electrical systems and, and, uh, start fires. Um, 
Now the boxes contain knockouts, and that's the little little discs around the inside of the uh, the breaker box. Uh, especially older construction, you may see where some has been knocked out, used for you know whatever, and that particular wiring had been removed uh, that normally would come through that hole. Or you may have an electrician that knocked out the wrong knockout. And uh, so you want to make sure that those are, are enclosed. There's little plugs that can be put in there. Um, if it was knocked out and not needed, they uh, they need to secure that to prevent anything that's not supposed to be in that, that uh, breaker box from getting in there. All right, lamps and light fixtures. Uh, they're subject to uh, deterioration, and uh, if they're not properly maintained, they definitely can deteriorate and uh, can cause some issues with the uh, the internal wiring and mechanisms and may have a rub point on the wiring or, or something like that. So we want to look at those closely, and uh, we know that our high temperatures that uh, that come from lamps can ignite combustible materials. Um, and that's especially one thing to look at and um, is if you see a, a lamp being used to light an area, you know, kind of feel ar around it, you know, not touching anything. But you know, see, does it put off excess heat? Are they using a 100 watt light bulb in a lamp that should normally have 40 watt bulb in it? Um, one of the greatest improvements and help to us as firefighters uh, or in, in people in uh, fire protection is uh, the LED bulbs that don't put off any light. And that can be a suggestion um, nowadays to change out to an LED that, you know, uses less power. It's better on the power bill, but also it's cooler. Um, and uh, I know our jurisdiction is changing in, in all the uh, the county buildings. If there's any issues with uh, the irregular fluorescent lights, they're changing them out to LEDs, and a lot of good uses to that. They remove, you, know, you take the ballast out. You don't even have to have the ballast in there, and the, the LED tubes are completely uh, interchangeable. And um, anyway, but uh, you know, they're always uh, another option that can be recommended. And um, make sure that the aerial lighting is proper size and type and uh, thermal barriers in place if, if need be. <clears throat> All right, uh, electrical motors, you wanna treat them to make as if they were running. You don't wanna put your fingers around anywhere that you don't wanna lose them. Um, you have different belts, gears, drives, uh, pulleys and all that associated with it. Also, um, you know, that may be something to wear. There may be a short, <clears throat> excuse me, a loose uh, wire connection or something of that nature that we want to be aware of that uh, we don't want to fool with. So um, be cautious. And, and that's around any electrical equipment. <clears throat> All right. The uh, potential fire hazards that may, we may encounter with electrical motors is sparks or arcing uh, when a motor short circuits. And we may see as it gets older and the bearings and the shafts on the inside kind of wear out. and uh, where the brushes and, and all on the inside may have an issue. Uh, it may throw out some sparks from time to time, or if it's over overcurrented uh, or has, has had overcurrent and the internals are damaged, uh, it can throw sparks or have a lot of arcing. Um, shaft bearings can overheat, and that's something to, uh, to be aware of. I've, I've seen that before with a bearing, and a lot of times if it's turned on, you can hear it screaming and a really loud squeal will come from them. And then uh, also dust deposits. Uh, and, you know, the thing with dust, it, it's talking about here that it can prevent, prevent heat from dissipating, but it also can be a uh, kind of a binder for lint and other type of debris that may get on there. And if they get hot, can ignite easily. All right, and any uh, or hazardous areas that may contain flammable liquids, gases, dusts, um, or other readily ignitable fibers, and uh, you may they may be required to run special equipment that is 
um, intrinsically safe, that it's protected from um, outside visible arcing sparks and things like that. All right, uh, some things to, uh, to be aware of too is um, according, it may be a, a building that has certain types of processes that um, where the um, static electricity can be an issue and uh, there may be certain grounding points and things like that around sparks um, and different precautions around areas of increased static electricity um, it's like at the gas pump you know you're supposed to there's supposed to be a place on the gas pump that you're supposed to touch to discharge any static electricity that's built up um, before you grab the nozzle so that it reduces the risk of a static electricity uh, igniting gasoline vapors um, now the different testing on any of your static electricity systems and discharges and all that the the testing is not going to be done by fire inspectors but just be aware uh, if they have a process or a need for something like that and then uh, you know making sure that relative humidity um, kept at a high level you know as the humidity drops a little drier climate it it helps the electrical um, electricity static electricity in the air and all that <clears throat> All right, so our, our heating and air systems, the common components, it's uh, used to convert an energy source into heating or cooling uh, medium uh, to distribute heating or cooling medium throughout the building. All right, so as a heating um, side, it, it uses whatever form that it's designed to, uh, um, to heat an element. And then it also uses motors and fans to distribute or blow that that either warm, the warmed air or the, the cooled air uh, throughout the building. And we need to, um, to be familiar that, with that type of system and, and kind of in general, you don't have to get real specific on it, but um, that that's how it works. And so that you can identify the different components uh, as a major part of the assembly. All right, so you have uh, the boilers, that generate steam, hot water, or hot um, or hot air, and those you may or may not see them around in this area. They may be in some of the older buildings that you may encounter. Um, the um, we have a in in Poplarville we have a, uh, a a few boilers that are in in uh, operation, and it's typically in kind of your older buildings or buildings that have been converted that. That run more efficiently on a, a boiler system, um, and uh, the building codes require the all the really specifics with it and any safeguards that are required for it. But uh, any room that has a boiler of five horsepower or greater is going to be considered a a separate room, and there are certain considerations for having a boiler room um, as far as fire protection and, and things of that nature. All right. The chiller plants that cool large uh, facilities are also may see um, what's called like a cooling tower, um, something like that. It uses uh, the internal refrigeration compressors and external cooling sources to act as a heat sink where it draws the the uh, heat out of the air, causing the air to get cooler and then it's blown around. Uh, it can also be used in different processes if it needs to uh, cool off items or something like that. Um, Again, this, your bigger process areas, your your industrial plants may have these large systems like that, and uh, just be aware that there's such a thing that's it's pretty much the same components and on the the same theory, but on a lot grander scale. Um, and your boiler inspectors and uh, you know they, I know the ones that I've dealt with, I just look at it to make sure it's been inspected. Uh, but a certified boiler inspector would have to come and tag it, uh, just like you have a uh, an inspector for a uh, sprinkler system or for your uh, portable fire extinguisher, stuff like that. Uh, the inspection includes, they check the, the piping, the boiler enclosure, and uh, your combustion safeguards um, associated with the system. 
All right, the distri distribution center or systems um, could be either direct or indirect methods to uh, move that heating or cooling throughout the building. Uh, the hot water um, to baseboard or fan cooled units, coil, sorry, fan coiled units, and uh, chilled water to fan coil or air handling unit. Um, you also have uh, hydronic heating and cooling systems that circulate water through the floor. Um, these are kind of coming popular in um, in some buildings that if they have the money to put it in, it's kind of an expensive system. I used to work at a fire station that had that system, and um, you know, it's uh, they were really building it for it to be a kind of a green, energy efficient system, and uh, you know, it's uh, kind of as I feel like as construction and architecture kind of goes this direction, we'll see more and more of it. All right, the part of the distribution system is your ducts, and uh, the air in them may be cleaned electrostatically. Um, the air is heated and cooled in the air handling unit, and then uh, the the return air is collected by the plenum system. And that's uh, where it, it pulls the air. That's typically where your um, your filter is at. Yeah, you may see the uh, exhaust systems in place removes it, removes fumes, vapors, mist, particles. Um, can be in, in a lot of different systems and, and settings. Just kind of be familiar with, with your buildings, if uh, especially if chemicals are used, uh, laboratories and things like that. Um, you know, they, they may have a, an exhaust system and, and it needs to be maintained properly. Uh, dust collection systems or chemical treatment systems may be uh, incorporated into buildings, so um, you know, that's something to note if, you, if you're inspecting a building that has uh, either one of those systems. For toxic materials, they uh, must reduce the toxicity to one half the level, uh, that is the IDLH, and uh, you really want to know if there's a system like that in, in, a, in your jurisdiction. Uh, dampeners are not permitted in these systems uh, because they're going to remove those. Their their main goal is to remove those hazards safely and correctly and in a, a large volume. All right, you have uh, smoke management systems. You have gravity vents that rely on the buoyancy of hot products uh, to open the vent in the ceiling. Um, and then uh, your compartmentalization or compartmentation relies on the interior smoke barrier um, that's that's put into the systems. Um, you know, you kind of have your gravity feeds. It's kind of like the uh, same thing as, uh, I guess, a, a good way to relate it is, is kind of like your uh, fireplace, your, your chimney on a fireplace. <clears throat> All right, and then uh, your pressurized method. Um, it uses the HVAC system to, to uh, depressurize smoke zones and um, the uh, leakage of the, the smoke barriers cause the air to leak into the zone of origin. It's not recommended to introduce new air or to make up air uh, to flush out smoke. And uh, you know these, these systems are designed to work and function properly and, uh, and whether des designed and installed, and uh, that typically comes through the plan review part, uh, where it's the type of occupancy and the type of processes. Uh, if you if you have a specific type of smoke management system uh, for that type of operation, <clears throat> uh, in high-rise buildings, there's a stairwell a smoke management system that. Um, and, and again, we, we talked about them being kind of a, an area of refuge, so uh, that are built to and, and managed to help people to escape and protect them from um, fire and smoke. Uh, we have the vestibules that can uh, can keep enclosed airway, stairways from uh, smoke contamination. And then um, you may have a mechanical pressurization 
of stairwells that may be used. Uh, again, that, that's going to be something that's going to be part of the planning and building phase. And um, that's something to keep aware of with any of the documentation on the, the buildings that you may inspect, uh, if they have something like that. All right, testing of an HVAC system includes the commissioning of the system, the acceptance testing, um, related documentation of the system, and then uh, annual testing, especially um, on the commercial larger uh, systems. And uh, you know, we also want to see it in our residential that uh, they're regularly inspected. And uh, I would say inspection would be a better word than testing. Um, you do have those that are certified and tested, especially in your uh, commercial settings, but um, you know, every HVAC system, even residential, should be inspected at least once a year. <clears throat> All right, the different pretend, or different hazards is uh, smoke distribution through the ducts. Um, they may need a smoke detector that will shut down the system if the smoke is detected. Um, and the duct detectors you'll typically um, see, especially if the building is required to have a monitored uh, a fire alarm system. Um, you know, duct detectors are a must, and, uh, and that does exactly it. If it sets off the alarm, then your normal fire alarm is gonna, gonna go off, but then it's also gonna shut down the air handling system uh, very fast to prevent the flow of smoke and, uh, and feeding fire into the fire room and all that. So um, uh, that's something that we wanna make sure that if those systems are required, the uh, detection system, that the ductor uh, detectors are in place and <clears throat> as uh, as required by code. Uh, different protection is dampeners, uh, fire dampeners, smoke dampeners, and a combination of smoke and fire dampeners. Um, again, that's going to be on your size of your uh, size of your system, size of your building, the occupancy class, um, and, and you, as it applies in the the code as to uh, if it requires any dampeners to be put in the system. And basically that's just gonna be uh, a doorway, like a, a valve that'll be closed uh, if the system's tripped, if it detects smoke or fire, uh, it, it goes ahead and, uh, and forms a barrier to close off the, the uh, ducts so that no air and smoke is moving. All right, here's a big one that you're going to run into and you're going to not you're going to have uh people that's that's going to think uh unkind about you, but um we we need to make sure that storage and non-essential materials um are, are not allowed in the boiler and chiller plant rooms. Um you know, it's um uh, like a lot of things they they need their space, they they don't need anything around them, so we want to make sure that those areas are uh, cleared. And it says it can cause sitting uh, in the unit, the flu in the room. Um, and according to where you put it, and, and you know how I've seen places store and stack items, it uh, you know it, it could be close to a unit and, and uh, can uh, cause a fire in, in there. Uh, shut down if tampering, rigging, removal, or poor maintenance is found, uh, especially for your boiler rooms. Um, you know, you're dealing with some pressurized, um, pressurized uh, steam and things like that. You, you don't want to play around with, so uh, you definitely want to make sure that uh, it's a proper working order. And if you see any of these issues, you definitely address it. And uh, you want to make sure that the uh, clearances to uh, combustible materials are maintained. Uh, they can deteriorate over time. And uh, and uh, it's kind of odd the way this was um, listed here. But uh, Way I'm looking at it is the clearances of from the systems to combustible materials, but 
Um, again, we want we don't want items to be stacked up close to um, to any of these units. And um, we'll make sure that those areas re remain uh, clear with proper spacing. All right, we want to pay attention to chimneys, flutes, and exhaust stacks. Um, now, if you if there's any damage, then that's something we need to uh, notate, and we need to make sure that a proper inspector, um, mechanical or structural inspector, um, gets notified. A lot of times, as an, a fire inspector, uh, you're going to work with the, your building department, your building officials, so that uh, that y'all are all on the same page. And, um, and that way you can report any issues. And uh, you may have those days where you look at something and say, man, that, that, that doesn't look right, that doesn't look safe. And then you have something that, that you can document that, you know, I found this, I observed this, um, this issue, and I forwarded it to our mechanical inspector. And, uh, you know, that kind of takes the, the monkey off your back as well. Um, We uh, also want to uh, be mindful of uh, the gas furnaces and hot water heaters. Um, you know, they, they typically have a, a pilot light that stays lit, and, uh, especially the older ones have a lot of issues here or there, maybe a, a leaking fuel. You, you have a, um, a constant pilot that is your ignition source, and if the fuel leaks, fuels in the area, it could cause some issues. So, uh, we want to make sure that those are, are properly maintained. Um, also, another thing around is uh, making sure that items, combustible items, are not stored around these type of equipment. Um, you know, you may see where, for whatever reason, that they think it's a good idea to store um, a gas can around it. And uh, you know, as those systems kick on, their the the LP gas is allowed to. Uh, to occupy kind of a combustion space, and when it ignites, it, it has the ability to not to ignite other vapors as well. So um, we need to be very cautious and and uh, look at these very closely well, closely while we're inspecting buildings that that have the gas furnaces and uh, water heaters. All right, uh, just kind of an, as a summary, we need to be aware of potential electrical hazards. Um, we need to be familiar with the electrical systems and their components. Um, we want to uh, to be aware of how electrical uh, systems, the faults in electrical system, can cause fire, and uh, try our best to, uh, to point those out and, and to prevent those fires. And uh, be familiar with the, uh, the overcurrent devices and make sure that they are in, in a proper um, being used properly. And uh, you know. Be observant for the obvious hazards that are uh, deteriorated and properly supported um, cables and conduits like we talked about. We want to uh, be familiar with HVAC systems and uh, the components that, that make that up and, and that they're, um, how they function and how that they can affect fires. Um, we need to be aware that the different additions to HVAC systems are in place to um, either like the dampeners or the um, the uh, duct detectors are, are used to uh, to uh, detect fire and smoke very quickly. And then uh, any specialized equipment that's used in industrial uh, settings, uh, we want to make sure that, that we're aware of those in our, our jurisdiction and that they're properly maintained as well. All right, we have any uh, any questions on uh, Electrical and HVAC. Yes, I have a question right quick. Um, sure. You spoke about extension cords and sure. putting stuff on top of extension cords. What if they have an extension cord and then like a commercial sized doormat or duct tape to prevent a tripping hazard? Is that acceptable or not? Uh, by code, it has it that um, file, um, extension cords are only to be used for portable, movable items. Um, so with that being said, I, I reiterate that. Now here's the problem. Tripping is one hazard, but as you have somebody walking across that 
industrial mat or walking across and stepping on top of where it was taped down, you're having that pressure um, and that friction that over time is wearing on the insulation and the wiring. Even for a heavy gauge wiring, uh, that amount of mechanical friction that, that takes place uh, over a period of time uh, can really wear on that and can cause arcing inside the the uh, um, extension cord. And, uh, you know, they're not designed to be done that way. Um, I have seen where in certain industrial areas uh, that are very code and safety strict that they'll have a raceway um, that kind of has a ramp that protects if a an electrical uh, extension cord is being used temporarily in a certain area for whatever certain job that they'll have that in place but it it protects the um, the extension cord from that mechanical friction um, if it's a commercial building I wouldn't allow it I'd, I'd have them change something because you, you're, that cord's getting damaged, um, over, and especially over a period of time, you, you're going to see a lot of wear that is on the inside that you may not see from the outside, but uh, it can definitely um, cause arcing and, and uh, can cause a fire underneath that. All righty, thank you. All right. Um, yeah, and even even the cheaper ones like, and I keep referencing the dollar store extension cords um, because as they get bent around, twisted, all that, you know, it can um, it damages that insulation. And the insulation is not really, you know, on those type is is not really that good, and it's not made for uh, mechanical friction or for a very little uh, long amount. But uh, any which way, any other questions on uh, electrical HVAC? Nope. Nope. Okay. Good deal. Um, yeah. What's that? Nothing. They're being goofballs. If uh, anybody wants a good reference material, NFPA 91 is a really good one to, to read if you have any questions or concerns over ventilation systems. Oh, absolutely. Um, and that's something, you know, IFC is pretty good about breaking breaking it down but um but a lot of times it, it references in into uh nfpa and um so good stuff all around all right getting into reading plans all right reading plans is uh yeah that's, that's part of the uh inspector too there they Whenever I took inspector, it was all included. You you come out as a um, a plans reviewer as well. Um, this it's kind of been separated out. They've they've changed it around to where that's kind of a separate class in and of itself. And um, this chapter um, kind of talks about it, kind of an informative thing. Um, but it, it it kind of to me more alludes to you know, if, if you wanted to be a plans reviewer, you know, kind of pursuing that class. Um, but there's some good things that we need to know on the processes of it. Uh, plans review is not really that difficult. Um, and, and some people can be intimidated by it. But you kind of look at it in in the respect that it's it's conducting a fire inspection on paper. Um so you're doing the same thing that you would do normally in a building. Uh, you would be looking at the same items that you need to look at, um, but you're catching it before it's built. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's something where you, you can catch a lot of things beforehand. And that's something to where um, I had a plan that I reviewed a few months ago to where they were wanting to build a a certain type of uh, of occupancy group, and because of subtle changes, they were trying to classify it as one thing where it wasn't that it was actually something different, and in the the code was was uh, much more 
uh, stringent on what they were wanting to build and having the safety features in place. So, uh, but, uh, getting into to, uh, the chapter, all right, our objectives uh, is we're going to list the reasons why plan review may be required and describe how to evaluate a plan review application. Describe the types of drawings included in a plan review or in a building plan. Uh, the types of views are uh, provided by the drawings and the sets, and um, how to determine if the occupancy of the structure is um, by using a set of plans. And we're going to describe to determine the building construction type using a set of plans. Um, how to determine adequate access for fire apparatus um, on your your plans for a structure. And then how to evaluate the building's egress system using plans and um, also the extinguishing systems uh, alarm systems and um, then um, your other different or your different type of protection systems that the building may require uh, again and you, you may classify it when you look at the plans uh, as something different than what the architect has classified it and um, that way you can point that out and you can have that dialogue with your your architect or your engineer and uh, explain as to why uh, you know they're they're good guys a lot of the times they'll they'll in my experience um, i've had a lot of them that work with me um pretty easily and uh you know you kind of just justifying your reasons and a lot of it's in black and white in the, in the code so um, The skills that are associated with it is uh, how to process a plan review application, perform a plan review to ensure all the applicable codes and standards are met, and to perform an in-field verification of shop drawings, plans, construction documents to ensure the proper compliance. All right, we know that's an important part of the fire prevention and code enforcement, and um, we're uh, you know that's their, our plan. We're going to confirm that all the the codes and standards are being met. By the building designer, and that uh, that the building is safe um, to occupy for the public and for firefighters to operate in. Now, model codes uh, have a little section on uh, plans review, and it gives the authority having jurisdiction the authority to review and approve projects before they they're constructed. Um, if you receive one that says not for construction, it you know, just shouldn't be reviewed. Um, you know, check check uh, your plans really good uh, prior to putting a lot of time into it. Uh, you know, go one page at a time, and I I may spend a little time even on the first page, even on just the plot plan, and uh, and start to work my way through it. Um, and you have the authority to require that. Uh, some changes and uh, for it to be resubmitted before it's approved. Um, going back on that, that previous, um, oh, come on now. All right, any which way, going back on that last uh, statement, uh, it was talking about making sure that the, the items are corrected before um, it's approved, you know, if it's, again, it's part of documentation. If it's not documented and it's not there, you know, you may have something that, that an issue that comes up later down the road, um, if they didn't, they may forget about or, uh, or have something come up and overlook it or whatever, and it's something that you need to be changed. And then when it comes to construction, you know, it's gonna show, your signature next to something that you wanted required. So make sure that you you really pay attention to it. If there's something that that you see that needs to be required, um, you can you can send it back and uh, before giving your signature of approval on the plans, um, and make sure that they submit a, an updated copy uh, with the changes in place. To it just kind of protects everybody. Um, now, the different documents that are reviewed as plans, blueprints, construction documents, and shop drawings and plan sets. Now, they're typically going to be in the big 
big rolls or uh, or big stapled together prepared uh, booklets that are large and cumbersome, but uh, they're going to have everything laid out in the plans. All right, your planning documents is going to be created by either architecture engineers or maybe a lot of both. Um, you have the title block on the right side of the page, um, and it's going to be drawn to scale, either an architect or engineer scale. Um, and there's typical, uh, you, you have to, you, typically you're going to have your, your scales in there together. Um, and it, you'll have a legend that'll show any of the, the scales and symbols and reference marks and all that as well. Just they're, they're pretty standardized. Once you, you do it for a little bit, you'll, you'll be able to know what it is, but it, it wouldn't hurt just to check and uh, look at the legend to see what they're emphasizing. If it's something that you, uh, need to take a little bit more time on or maybe prepare on, maybe grab a couple other books or uh, reference, um, you know, code references to uh, before checking that chapter on it or that section of it. All right, uh, code analysis is uh, the summary of, of features of fire protection and building characteristics that will affect the plan review. Uh, it's going to show your occupancy classification, construction type, your building area, the occupant, uh, load fire protection systems and egress uh, means of egress the um the thing about it is we want to go back and double check um you know people are human and uh they may make mistakes um now here's something you're and, and something to be mindful of um according to what company that you work with you may or may not get the fire protection system on the set of plans. Uh, you may have just the building plans and, and just take a minute and check to, to see what all is included in that set of plans. You may have um, a set of plans that acknowledge that uh, sprinkler systems will be required at this building but it may not have anything in there with the uh, any of your uh, layout of your sprinkler system that may come through, if, if, especially if they contract out with a, a sprinkler company to engineer uh, for that building. They may not have the engineering finished in the, the fire flow and the calculations yet. Uh, so that may come in another plan um, that you'll have to approve separately for that same construction process, um, project. All right, so we have site plans. It's going to show the overview of the lot being reviewed. Uh, they're going to show the contour lines for elevation, proposed and existing buildings, property lines, and utilities. Um, they're going to show, uh, they're going to orient themselves to the north. As you can see, this is plans for a fire station. And um, have a uh, real quick, anybody know what a fire station, um, a typical manned fire station is going to be grouped as? Any ideas? Lodging? Yeah, it'd be uh, residential uh, under the same you know, lodging. And uh, in that, it's going to require, um, because you have people sleeping there, it's going to require a new construction, uh, sprinkler systems and all that. So um, you know, dorm rooms and, and all that as well, it kind of falls into that same category. But, uh, all right. Another thing on the site plans uh, that you can check for apparatus access roads. If there's, like you see in this plans, uh, if you look closely to the right, uh, you can see the parking lot area. And, uh, you know, you can see the landscape, the proposed landscape that's included. Uh, curbs and their relation to the streets, the water mains and things of that nature. Hydrant locations. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, also, you can look in there, uh, because this is going to be a, a residential occupancy, um, look for your FDC connections. They should be listed on the uh, outside perimeter of the building, um, and you can go in and look in your stand and, uh, or where the standpipe room would be, um, and hopefully uh, the sprinkler system would be included in that set of plans. But you can look at your FDC locations to make sure that your hydrant 
that you have a hydrant to supply the engine that's going to connect into the FDC, and that you also have your apparatus access road uh, to be able to get to the fire department connections. All right, structural plan is going to show the uh, proposed building load bearing uh, components, and um, yeah, that's going to be kind of your your uh, cut in half view um, where you'll see like in this one kind of looks like some um, steel beam um, girder construction. Um, can't see it uh, real close, but um, so it's uh, you know also the different type of uh, uh, construction and then also your um, is going to have information about your foundation, uh, floor and roof construction. <clears throat> All right, your architectural plans are going to show uh, the floor plans reflected at uh, ceiling plans, building sections, elevations, building details. Um, and you can see where this was uh, for the fire station. It's going to show you what it's going to look like from the street view. Um, and this may be um, like, say you have a strip mall, you know, they may list in and already have an artist depiction of uh, if they already have lots for um, other businesses or buildings that's dedicated um, to part of that construction. Um, if they're if they're dedicated and contracted to occupy a space once completed, you know, they may throw those in there. And um, but. Um, it also includes the features of specific components, um, and you want to verify any of the life safety requirements that may be required on the outside uh, from that. It should have a um, kind of a 360 view of it or in the architectural plan section. Your electrical plans, the showing the circuits, the outlets, lighting, uh, and it's uh, kind of based on the floor plan. You'll see the same plan kind of used over and over. Um, but they'll have for, you know, you'll have one for electrical, one for plumbing, one for the heating, one for lighting, one, for, you know, so on and so forth. There are all the different components of, of the building. And, um, and the, uh, fire detection, or fire alarm and detection systems may be included. And that may be on a separate, um, plans that comes from the contractor that's going to install the, the alarm system. All right, your mechanical uh, shows your HVAC lays out, uh, layouts of the proposed building, plumbing, sprinkler systems. Um, you know, we'd already talked about that, where it may or may not be included. Your specification books, all right, it's going to collect all the information about the project, the details, and components required to meet the design criteria, and any information on um, on how they're going to construct the building, where they're going to store items, when are you know, what phases. Uh, if it's a multi-phased uh, development or something of that nature, and um, and it follows the Construction Specification Institute master format. That's mouthful there. <clears throat> so we have the plan view. It shows everything above or below a horizontal slice of the building area, and um, the elevation view. And um, according to if they work any certain features around different landscaping and um, all that, you'll be able to see it in these different views, uh, your sectional views. Um, detailed views in the, you know, this is showing a sprinkler system um, and a riser uh, assembly. And it's you know, very detailed. You can look at it, and you can see, you know, it, it even has your your sizes, your like your four inch uh, check valve for the fire department connection, the uh, six inch um, um, mains, your two inch domestic supply, your pressure gauges, and all that. It's all all listed in there. Um, and that with the uh, riser mounted with the air compressor, so. Um, should it be a dry system and not a wet system? So, uh, 
and that, that gives you the idea what you can kind of expect the type of, uh, of system and we'll, we'll get into sprinkler systems uh, later on this week. All right, it begins with a meeting during the conceptual phase of project. Um, and it's going to continue through the occupancy of the building. You're going to get asked, I know we talked about this, but for some reason we can't do this, so we need to do that. And you'll go back and review and, and see if that's going to work for you uh, or they need to do something else. And, and that's the time where you can work with these developers and these uh, contractors to um, – If, if variances are uh, something that you can work in. Um, the, the whole procedure may last quite a while. You, you may be in contact with uh, developers and builders for, for quite a while. Uh, I'm, at, I'm currently working with a um, um, developer that's wanting to put in a, uh, a large gas station in my um my jurisdiction and it's just we've had a lot of, of processes of you know figuring fire flow um and building construction construction type kind of tailoring everything to make it work and, and you know that's something else you may end up having to do but you know if you're if they're wanting if, if the area for an example say is in a prime area but the utilities aren't there they they may do what they can to get what utilities can be there, and you may, uh, they may fall short on whatever requirements, but certain variances can be made to uh, to kind of balance the scales uh, for the give and the take. But um, you know, the preliminary meetings with the architect kind of establishes the expectations and communications, and that's that's one of those things that you can kind of establish a. Um, a quick rapport that you know hey we're we're here to you know we want you to to, to build in our area we want you to uh, be successful in this and you know we want it to be safe to occupy and you know everybody has those same goals and uh, you know those meetings typically go go pretty well all right the application phase is um, we'll keep the record of, of when the plan is set is accepted, approved, disapproved, released, returned, uh, if there's any changes need to be made or anything like that. <clears throat> we have the review phase where we take a look at the site plan. We look at the proposed building in relation to uh, lot lines and other structures, um, access for firefighters, the uh, apparatus access, um, access route. Um, you know, we talked about the uh, hydrant spacing, if it's appropriate. Um, hydrant coverage for for space area, uh, how the landscape's going to be, and, and uh, you know that may be something too. Is is according to how big your city is, and a nice way of putting it, I guess, is how big your governmental entities um, building and beautification departments are. They may be included on this too, and they may review the site plan, and they may uh, have a a standard of construction um, in mind for new construction that requires um, a certain aesthetic levels. And um, I don't know if any of you have, have ever been able to go through Madison, Mississippi, but it's a small town of um, of affluent people. And they have an, a, a level of aesthetics that are required on all their buildings. And they actually have a plans reviewer that they have to submit um, landscaping plans to make it look nice. Now, where does that fall into the fire inspector? Because sometimes they're thinking of one thing where yours is safety. And, and that's one of those things that you, and I, I say all this to say that you may have to deal with other entities of your own jurisdiction um to you know, get the features in in the places where they need to be um for safety and and uh, you know it's kind of the the landscaping and aesthetics come second in, in my opinion um and that that's should how those meetings go but um all right we have the review phase where the structural plans we're gonna uh 
we're going to look at the uh, the information as the uh, on the load bearing construction structural components um, determine the structure type the um, and then the the max height and the maximum area uh, for the the construction project uh, the architectural plans looking for the occupancy classification um, the occupancy load the egress requirements, any protection systems that may be required, and uh, that our rated walls um, have been tested. And then um, that's basically going back on your um, your information that you're going to pull on um, if you need a, a um, an area that, that has a certain level of, of fire resistance or um, fire protection that that wall rating is what they need and that's the, the level of protection that that should be required um, for that that uh, project uh, we're going to look through the electrical and mechanical plans to show the wiring diagrams lighting um, also uh, in there we show where our smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors are located um, your mechanical planning uh, plans, the types of locations of your heating appliances and so forth and so on. And then also that your fire resistant rating is provided on your, your you know, not only your in your construction of the building, but also uh, in the assemblies that may be used. You may have to have a fire rated um, door assembly and, and making sure that that's, uh, that's in place as well. And then your fire protection system plans that are required in new building buildings um, and making sure that it falls into the NFPA 13 and whether it's going to be a 13R or 13D or regular 13 system, deluge system, or uh, what all is required uh, for that, that building and, and uh, type, type of occupancy. Um, and uh, like I spoke before, is we're going to make sure that the, the uh, designer is on the same page uh, so that you agree with the uh, the correct occupancy and or commodity uh, classification of the building. The uh, alarm systems, uh, and we want to make sure that the NFPA 72 and 70 is followed. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more on that as, as those chapters come up. But uh, and we want to make sure that we specify the even to the size of wire that's being used uh, now nfpa does specify that but we want to make sure that they're um you know they may slip in something of you know say and i can't remember off the top of my head but you know say that their nfpa specifies a certain gauge wiring to to interconnect the alarm systems and they just put in there a smaller diameter wire because it's cheaper you know we want to make sure that you know we review that and catch that so uh, it's being installed properly um, we will make sure that the system is, is large enough and, and is arranged the way that it, it uh, um, covers the, the the intent of the system there um, that all the initiating devices are listed and um, you know, your notification appliance locate uh, locations and sound pressure levels are, are, are proper and um, you know, verifying the fire alarm and detection system functions is uh, they have that bullet in there but that kind of to me seems like uh, uh, <laughs> that's uh, something for later on uh, whenever you're doing the, the inspection and acceptance testing of those uh, features. Uh, if, if they have a chemical suppression system um, that uh, you, know, you look for the gas system and that's designed to protect uh, the uh, specific hazard or area and um, that uh, you know, like for your, your hood systems and uh, or either it could be like a server room where they have a halon system or something like that. And uh, you want to make sure that it's adequate for that type of hazard. And then uh, in the review phase, we're, we're looking for uh, deficiencies and variances. 
uh, we'll make sure that uh, we bring it to the attention of the submitter and it may re require correction before a permit is issued and that may should be crossed out and put must require correction uh, because before that you know once they have that permit in hand um, you know we want to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that um, that you've pointed out those issues and that they have acknowledged it and are, are willing to to do it the way that you've prescribed um, or if we can work together and trying to find a variance for it uh, if there's a reason why they can't do it as prescribed and then also uh, we want to suggest the uh, designer hire a consultant who knows the codes um, and you know a lot of your um, sometimes I've gotten calls from developers that say hey I'm wanting to develop a whatever in your jurisdiction, what kind of code set that you use. And they'll they'll have a fire protection engineer that they'll work with, that their com company contracts with, um, to consult and to make sure that they're following the codes where all you have to do is look at it, agree to it, and sign it. Uh, it makes the process a lot easier. And if, if it, they're a good, in my opinion, if they're a good um, company, then they'll they'll do that and they'll have it double checked. Um, your older buildings may require a variance or an appeal um, where you need to appear before a board of appeals, and that's you know a variance is where you're you're willing to work with them and, and kind of find a, a happy medium. But your board of appeal, if you prescribe a certain change or item in there, um, there is no variance to it, and they don't agree to it, um, and that's where you you prepare uh, to give your statement. At a board of appeals, whoever your appeal um, board is uh, for your jurisdiction. All right, and the approval phase, you want to notify the interested party that the plan set is approved, and they can go for uh, move forward with uh, site prep and construction. Um, you know, note the approval of the plan set in the record on the future building, and. Um, You know, if you keep a kind of a case file uh, for each new construction, you know, that's part of the documentation that we want to kind of keep together. And then our site visits, we want to ensure that the approved plans are being set and used for construction, and uh, we can coordinate with the construction superintendent. And uh, hopefully, he has uh, common sense. Um, sometimes you you deal with people that. Um, can frustrate you uh, because they do things that are not in the plans. Um, and if you find that, if if the approved plan set is not being used, they're using something else or, or they're just ignoring uh, features included in the plan, you should you can, uh, have a, a stop work until a meeting can be arranged and that you can make sure that it's being done properly. Uh, I've actually had to deal with that myself um, here about a month ago um, over a fire department connection placement. And, um, you know, I, I was in there with the uh, big wigs of this construction company teaching a, uh, being facetious, but having to, uh, to teach a water system class to them so that they can understand why um, the the certain features of a sprinkler system are required to be in certain areas and uh, you know with with uh, just a little bit of effort I got them to see it my way and got it repaired um, and, and but uh, you know we want to make sure to make these site visits so that you know things are going together properly and, and, and coordinate with your building official or your building inspector it just makes it a lot easier uh, because if the guy has to, the construction superintendent, he's got a lot on his plate. And if he has to go and deal with the building guy, breathing down his neck, and then you come and he's got a lot of things to do, um, you want to make sure that uh, if you, you come up both at the same time, then you can kind of have each other's back and kind of know what uh, each other's interests are. Um, and they, they can kind of see that uh, you're working together, that you know what you're doing. Makes it a lot easier. 
All right, uh, commissioning or the testing of the fire protection systems before the occupancy, and that's where you'll have your pressure test of the um, the sprinkler systems, um, your testing of your alarm systems, um, pressure uh, pressure tests are typically they're, they're, they take a long while to do, and uh, either you can witness it or um, the superintendent or architect or uh, somebody that's going to take responsibility can witness it and then um, and that's one of those things that what I recommend is uh, you know before a place is is ready to uh, occupy that you bring your fire department or your, your guys through so and identify any anything of importance and uh, any building features that have changed that uh, that they may need to know about and then uh, if you do a um, pre-fire plan, that those plans are updated as well. All right, you have your performance-based the performance design. Is, historically, fire codes have been prescriptive. Um, an alternative now available is performance-based design, and that's where your uh, solutions are designed to achieve a specific goal for a particular use or application. Um, and you may see this more and more. Um, because it's you know, people is kind of doing some um, some really new and, and innovative things in construction, so it may not be covered under the code. And so to prevent it from just being allowed to do whatever uh, without insight, um, you know, that's something that that you can research and, and determine if it's going to uh, to fit your application. Um, as the as the fire code official, you have the final. Uh, approval of the whatever design um, but uh, you know they it may have been designed by an engineer or fire protection engineer or uh, architect somebody that that uh, that's really put in the um, the time to research the materials involved and the construction of those materials and so on and so forth um, and you may have to ask for technical assistance um, and uh, you may have a question that you may not completely be um, understand or be familiar with, and uh, you can have a third party to uh, to look at it. Um, you may, in an appeals process or in a variance, uh, you may contact technical assistance, um, and that's uh, for any type of insight and then also you know you use your network if you uh, have other inspectors they may have dealt with something um, similar that they may be able to kind of guide you in a direction um, to find your answer um, and then the evaluation um, like say if a contractor sends off for technical uh, review and it, it comes back in a report uh, you still evaluate that report. It's it's submitted to you as as a fire code official, and uh, it's your responsibility and authority to be able to sign off on it or to reject it according to uh, uh, the situation. Equivalencies and alternatives. Equivalencies give the permissibility of a method, process, system, or device of a superior quality, strength, or durability. All right. So um, I know I've kind of mentioned before. Um, one of the things that comes to mind pretty quickly is exit signs and uh, exit lighting um, and mainly the exit signs but you know code sets were always built on you know specific type of light and power and uh, candle light or, or candle power um, but uh, you know if you have a, a different system some type of new glow-in-the-dark trinium whatever system that provides that amount of lighting um, is it going to be equivalent is it going to fit in in there and you know that's up for you to decide of whether or not you'll accept that and then uh, alternative clause allows the code pro uh, provisions to be altered in a way that it's not going to reduce the safety in the building um, and that's that's a big part of, of a fire inspector is you you know the you know the intent of the code. What is it trying to do? 
why was was time and effort put in the into the the writing testing discussion and publication of that specific line of code <clears throat> and that's where you as a as an official may have to look at that and say you know um this particular things as is as it is prescribed is not going to work but you know we can do away with this and we can do that and that's kind of where where i talk a lot about at variances is is um you know the give and the take and you, you find the balance in, in the in the middle um uh, a way to help with if you have to do alternative clauses is uh in your code books and your, your reference materials um, get a copy of uh, of what's called the um commentary and having the commentary it has the code um as it is prescribed but it also has a paragraph to explain the content and explain the intent and uh it, it kind of breaks it down um i've heard some inspectors call it a uh dummy's guide to fire inspection but it's it's not really because to be an effective code official, if you have the intent, if you have, um, you know, that background information, you're more informed to make those decisions. Um, and you, you know your area, you know your response capabilities, you know, you know, a lot of your variables in it. So you may be able to have uh, the ability to, to give... Um, an alternate provision or a variance to um, change the way that it is, but uh, to be able to maintain that level of safety. All right, guys, here to the end, we're uh, just summarizing. All right, so the objective of plan review is uh, we're gonna do the fire inspection on paper. Um, and, and that's before it even gets built. And uh, we're going to make it uh, make sure that it's safe for the public to occupy. And, and if there's a fire, for firefighters to be able to go in and, and do what they do best. Um, it's all documentation. And it's reviewing those documents. And uh, we need to be familiar with all the different sections of it. Um, we we want to make sure that all the, the features that are listed in the, the plans meet code and uh, or it's something that we can have a variance to or uh, it works for the application to maintain a level of, of uh, fire protection um, we want to make sure that all of its areas and systems and occupancy and egresses and all uh, are in par um, and uh, we want to make sure that that uh, you know they include all the information that we we need to be able to, to um, sign off on it and um, you know we know the uh, the types of the plans, and and you'll you'll get very familiar with them as you you look at different uh, plans. And this may be something you you may get the uh, um, the urge your next shift to contact your fire code official and pull down plans so that you can just kind of older plans so that you can look through them and be familiar with them and, and get familiar with them um, so that whenever you, you do a plan review you're um, you know what's uh, what's going on and uh, able to to get through the the plan books easier um, and uh, you know if we if we review these plans and uh, we we'll probably evaluate the the building and, and uh, we evaluate the, the different applicable codes, you know, we're, we're going to, um, um, we're going to make sure that that building is being built properly and safely. And, uh, you know, that's something that we want to make sure that, you know, if we have a, that new construction that, you know, we're happy with our family going in and, uh, and using that, that building and using that, uh, that business. So, all right, uh, gentlemen, any, uh, any questions? Any questions at all on plans reviews?
Do I just lose everybody? We still here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's, that's one of those things. Uh, it, it takes time. And um, we'll, uh, you know, my, my first few times of, of reviewing plans, it's kind of like, what is all this mess? But, you know, it's, it'll, it'll come. It just comes with experience. Um, a lot of the plans review stuff is level two, um, level two uh, information. So uh, we will see some of these uh, features and requirements in the, uh, in part of the testing.